All right, and we're right here at noon, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome, everyone. We're so glad that you're here spending the afternoon with us uh, over the lunch hour to have a fun opportunity to learn a little bit more about Wisconsin's amphibians and reptiles from two incredible experts, Rory and Josh. Really, really grateful that you're here today. My name is Caitlin Williamson. I'm the Director of Conservation Programs with the Natural Resources Foundation of Wisconsin. And on behalf of NRF, uh, I want to thank you so much for joining us in this webinar, for your interest in amphibians and reptiles. And I also wanted to just briefly remind everyone today that it's a spring primary here in Wisconsin. So hopefully you've gone out and voted or have a plan to do so. If you need to find out where your polling place is, you can visit myvote.wi.gov. So just a quick overview of the Natural Resources Foundation for those who maybe aren't familiar with our work. We are a statewide Wisconsin-based conservation nonprofit. And we were founded back in 1986 to really bridge private sector support for our public natural resources. We help protect our state's lands, waters, and wildlife by providing strategic funding, leading conservation partnerships, and connecting all people with nature in Wisconsin. Our grant making invests more than $1 million annually in on the ground conservation and environmental education efforts, supporting the work of our hundreds of partners across the state. Our signature programs like the field trip program, maybe some of you have been on one of our field trips uh, or per participated in our Great Wisconsin Birdathon event. Uh, those events engage thousands of people in learning about and caring for Wisconsin's amazing natural heritage through hands on learning experiences outside. We also help to advance conservation efforts in Wisconsin by leveraging funding and resources and bringing together partners to really protect our rarest landscapes and wildlife species that we have here in the state, such as the many different amphibians and reptiles you'll be learning about uh, over the next hour. You can learn more about our work and become one of the thousands of people across the state who are a member by visiting wisconservation.org. So a little bit about um, kind of our connection to the amphibian and reptile work. Uh, really, this started with the launch of our Wisconsin Amphibian and Reptile Conservation Fund. Back in 2017, we noticed a significant funding gap for amphibian and reptile conservation in the state. So we worked with dozens of individuals and organizations. Some of you are probably on the webinar today, so thank you for your support in this to establish a first of its kind permanent endowment fund, the Wisconsin Amphibian and Reptile Conservation Fund to provide sustainable funding for Wisconsin's turtles, toads, frogs, lizards, snakes, and salamanders. The fund supports on the ground conservation and research activities, such as the mud puppy conservation project you'll hear about from one of our speakers today. It also will support the restoration of habitat that really benefits reptiles and amphibians in the state, training of citizen scientists who help monitor rare and threatened species and education and outreach efforts. We're continuing to seek donations of any amount outright or planned gifts for this really special fund uh, to continue to grow it and hopefully support as many uh, amphibian and reptile conservation projects as possible through it. So if that's of interest, you can learn more about the fund uh, or donate by visiting wisconservation.org slash W-A-R-C-F. Another way to get involved is by joining us on one of our NRF field trips. Our field trip program connects thousands of people each year to Wisconsin's natural wonders, offering more than 250 trips every year that are led by different conservation experts. We have some uh, field trips planned for this year that will explore Wisconsin's amphibians and reptiles, including an off-trail hike in the Northern Kettle Moraine to look for amphibians, an opportunity to learn about the amphibians of the North Woods up at the Camp Natural Resource Station, a twilight frog chorus field trip at the Ridges Sanctuary in Door County, and a five mile paddle down the Tomahawk River in search of several species of turtles. Some of these field trips are also fundraisers for the Wisconsin Amphibian and Reptile Conservation Fund. And registration opens for our NRF members at noon on Tuesday, April 4th, and I'll give a little teaser that maybe there's going to be an amphibian or reptile on the cover of our field trip guidebook, which is exciting. Uh, and so you can find out more and become a member and get the guidebook to access these field trips at wisconservation.org slash field trips. So I will introduce our speakers for today and then turn it over to them to share more in depth about Wisconsin's amphibians and reptiles, uh, including the inside look at the creation of this amazing long awaited book. So Dr. Joshua M. Kopfer is a professor at UW-Whitewater 
and a certified wildlife biologist. Josh has lived most of his life in Southern Wisconsin. He was born in Stoughton, just south of Madison. He earned his bachelor's and master's degrees from the University of Wisconsin La Crosse in biology and a PhD from the University of Wisconsin Milwaukee in ecology and evolution. His doctoral research investigated numerous aspects of gopher snake ecology and conservation in Sauk County. After earning his doctoral degree, Josh worked for the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources, NRC Environmental Consulting, now Stantec, and Elon University in North Carolina. Since 2011, Josh has been with the biology department at the University of Wisconsin Whitewater, where he teaches various lecture and field-based ecology courses and conducts research with undergraduate students. He is broadly interested in vertebrate ecology and conservation, with publications centered on amphibians, reptiles, fish, and mammals, although he will admit to a particular fondness for Wisconsin's reptiles. He currently lives in Walworth County with his family. Rory Pulaski is a conservation biologist with the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources Bureau of Natural Heritage Conservation. Rory has been a conservation biologist specializing in amphibians and reptiles with the Wisconsin DNR since 2004. She also works on a variety of regulatory issues related to Wisconsin's endangered species law. Current amphibian and reptile work includes surveying eastern Massasauga rattlesnakes, ornate box turtles, Blanchard's cricket frogs, and slender glass lizards, coordinating amphibian citizen-based monitoring projects, and conducting inventory surveys on state properties. Rory has a bachelor's degree in biology from UW-Eau Claire, a master's degree in wildlife ecology from UW-Stevens Point, and is currently working toward her PhD at UW-Madison, researching Eastern Massasauga rattlesnakes in Wisconsin. And with that, I will turn it over to Josh to get started. And we're gonna have a presentation on the front end uh, from, from Josh, and we'll turn it over to Rory from there. And, uh, and then we'll have time at the end for a Q&A. Um, and I also wanted to share that we're gonna be doing a giveaway of the <laughs> long-awaited, quite large, uh, Amphibians and Reptiles of Wisconsin book signed by both of our presenters today. And so we'll be uh, drawing names uh, from our registrants who are who are here today or attendees today. So uh, winners will be receiving an email from me. Um, and Josh, with that, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, thank you, Caitlin. Uh, can it, hopefully you can see my screen. Um, yes, it looks great. Great. I apologize that uh, my video capacity is uh, minimal. Uh, I have my laptop on a docking station in my office and it has to be closed. But um, Caitlin uh, covered uh, every my, everything about myself here, so I'm not going to go into any more depth introducing myself. And uh, basically, as, as she reviewed, I'm going to start talking about sort of general concepts uh, related to amphibian and reptile conservation in Wisconsin, and then and then turn it over to Rory, who will talk about some specific projects. Um, but I, I was also asked to talk a little bit about uh, the book that Caitlin held up. And so real briefly, um, I thought I'd overview um, this book a little bit. And um, so th this book was published in uh, 2022 uh, by the University of Wisconsin Press. And um, it was a book that uh, uh, the process of which com uh, to complete this book began nine years prior to its publication. So it took us nine years to complete um, getting this book together. And the, the, the book itself is um, rather large. Uh, it's almost 12,000, I'm sorry, almost 1,200 pages. Uh, I'm told it weighs over nine pounds. Uh, so it's quite hefty. Uh, there's over 300 color figures, over 2,000 citations in the book. And so the, the goal of this uh, book was first, you know, when, when we started was to make something that was um, kind of a, a, a scientific treatise on the amphibians and reptiles of the state. Now, we're, we'll come back to that in a second. But one of the aspects of this book that I'm personally very, very happy with is that there are over 50 contributing professionals that were involved in this book. So Donald uh, Brown and I were the editors of the entire book and we wrote or co-wrote numerous uh, chapters, but there were over 50 other individuals that came together to work on this book. And so we, we tried to make sure we talked to people who, were, um, who had uh, direct experience with the species that uh, we asked them to write about if possible and specifically in Wisconsin, or at the very least, the upper Midwest, Midwest. So 
we wanted to make sure we had a breadth of voices and a, and a, and a breadth of level, uh, a breadth of experiences, I'm sorry, uh, among the people involved in this book so that it was, you know, sort of a group effort. And, and I'm very happy that it worked out that way. Not everybody we asked um, could be involved, but um, we got a really, really great uh, batch of contributors to be involved in this book. And I think it's added a, a, a level to um, the quality of the book that makes me very, very uh, pleased to have uh, been able to achieve that. So basically, to, to give you an idea of what the book contains, how do you end up with you know, a 12, nearly 1,200 page, nine pound book that takes nine years to complete um, with the species in the state? Well, each species obviously gets an in-depth review of identification. And so the, the norm is to identify adults, obviously. And so we clearly do that in the text of each species account. Uh, we review how to identify uh, the adults, but we also take time to discuss how to identify uh, juveniles, including larval amphibians and also eggs. So um, to, to supplement the text of each species account, we also included, uh, you can see a picture here of an example, uh, dichotomous keys to help with identification of species that are encountered. This is the, that's showing here is the dichotomous key for the uh, larval salamanders of the state. And so um, you can see there's some really nice artwork here. Uh, Dr. Eric Wild, who's associated with Stevens Point, did the artwork for the book. And so um, all of the taxonomic keys have um, really nice artwork associated with them to aid in identification of the larval phases uh, and the adults. So um, we wanted to make sure that it was a useful document or a useful manuscript for identification. But we also wanted to include uh, as much information on the ecology of those organisms as we possibly could. And so uh, each species account in the book has a detailed review of taxonomy, evolution, um, distribution, both state distribution and um, global distribution. So we discussed distribution in the text, but then we also include range maps, both state and global range maps, um, a detailed review of habitat, reproduction, activity, predator, prey. And then we also took, both Donald and I felt very strongly that it would be important to include a lot of information on conservation and management. And that has become more common in books of this nature, but um, it's still not the norm to focus heavily on conservation and management. But we both believe that was a very important aspect or needed to be an important aspect of this book because we're you know, experiencing massive losses of species globally. So including as much robust scientific information on conservation and management as possible would be great. And so we did this a couple of ways. We started the book with introductory chapters generally focused on uh, conservation and management. So just a smattering of examples, there's a figure Donald shows talking about the loss of habitat for amphibians and reptiles in Wisconsin over the last many, many decades. We can see how that's changed over time. We also included a review of management activities here is a picture of a segment from the book about management. Uh, and we broke that down, focusing generally on different habitat communities. This is a segment on the prairies and grasslands, and it includes uh, then uh, subcategories about techniques that are sort of typical for those types of habitats. So we have these general introductory uh, chapters focused on amphibian and reptile conservation as a whole. But we also, in each species account, devoted a section of that account specifically to the habitat, I'm sorry, the conservation and management issues that relate specifically to that organism. So there's a lot of info on conservation and management in this book. So who is this book useful for? It's clearly useful for professionals. I mean, when we begin the process, uh, both Donald and I had been graduate students and we were academics, you know, and and we knew that it was very useful to have a source with compiled information. Uh, so as researchers, we could find as much robust scientific information about a species as we could. So we wanted to create kind of a one-stop shop for that, for people who were um, graduate students, academics, working as state regulators or federal regulators, and also working as environmental consultants. I've worked in all of those uh, uh, in all of those types of employment opportunities, except a federal regulator. And you know, my experience was that having that information at hand would have been uh, very useful in a sort of compiled source. So we wanted to make sure it was useful for professionals and we, and we think we've achieved that, but we didn't want to um, sort of 
shun other people that might be interested in amphibians and reptiles. And so we took great pains to also make sure it would be useful for anyone who's interested in natural resources, wildlife, and the outdoors, even just a, a sort of passing interest in those things. And so we did that in a couple of ways. First of all, as I mentioned, the book is rife with color photos. So uh, UW Press pulled out all the stops. They didn't restrict use of color photos or the number of photos uh, figures we included in the book. So literally every page, this is just an example from the Cope's Great Tree Frog account, but every page is littered with color photos. So there's lots of interesting things to look at. We had, as I had alluded to before, numerous introductory chapters with general appeal. So this is from our uh, historical chapter, a chapter on prominent historical figures in Wisconsin herpetology. And so we think that people who have a passing interest in uh, natural resources and history would find something of value to read there. We also then included an introductory chapter focused on vegetative communities in the state to give people with a, and how those might relate to amphibians and reptiles. So giving people with a passing interest in vegetative communities, um, something that you know they could find particularly interesting. This has uh, information on the types of plant species you might find in each communities and photographs, giving an idea of what habitat and vegetative communities are out there for amphibians and reptiles. And then each species account includes what we called an at a glance section. So the species accounts all begin with essentially a paragraph, a longish paragraph that includes um, a summary of all the information that folks might need to just get sort of a, a basic idea about a given species without having to wade through all of the detail of those uh, species accounts if they didn't want to. So the at a glance section includes you know, uh, everything, uh, a basic a bit of information about everything you might need about that organism, how to identify it, where it's generally found in the state, habitat, activity, conservation issues, et cetera. So every species account starts with that simple summary that somebody can just look at and decide whether they wanna wade into the account or not. And then finally, we, we, we took a book, uh, a page out of the, the first treatise on amphibians and reptiles in Wisconsin written by uh, Richard Carl Vogt, uh, in the 80s, and he included a lot of anecdotal information and stories from his experiences. And so we wanted to do likewise. And so we have these, what we call natural history boxes that include um, a range of different types of information. Some of them include new data, but many of them are simply interesting stories that any individuals have had about interacting with amphibians uh, and reptiles in Wisconsin. This is an example of one about prairie skinks written by uh, Heather Caraca at the Wisconsin DNR. So um, some of these are just, you know, an interesting encounter we've had with these species and our own sort of experience and so on. And so we really wanted to tailor these aspects of the book to um, just the person who had a passing interest in wildlife, passing interest in natural resources or uh, amphibians and reptiles. So that's a little bit of a background about the book, natural, the Natural Resources Foundation uh, help support publication of the book, and we greatly appreciate that. But let's move on to the sort of meat of this uh, discussion today, um, and uh, helping to transition into Rory is what's uh, what Rory is going to talk about more, uh, and that's amphibian and reptile conservation here in Wisconsin. So Wisconsin is uh, home to um, a number of different types of species of amphibian and or reptile in the state. These are just a smattering of examples, but we have 23 snakes, 11 turtles, four lizards, seven salamanders, and 12 frog toad species. So if we think about our diversity here in Wisconsin, the species richness in Wisconsin, compared to other states in the US, it's moderate, right? We don't have a massive number of species here in Wisconsin compared to Florida or North Carolina or Mississippi. But where our species are particularly interesting, in my opinion, is because of where Wisconsin is located here in the upper Midwest and the different sort of environments that are found in Wisconsin, our species have a large breadth of adaptations to this huge variety of habitats and conditions that they're faced with. So if we look at um, an example of the different ecological provinces and sections here that are found in Wisconsin, we can see we have these large categories in the north, the Laurentian mixed forest, and in the south, the Midwest broadleaf forest. But within those 
there are many subcategories of different types of ecological sections, right? We have the Northern Highlands, we have the Wisconsin Central Sands, et cetera, et cetera. And so essentially with all of these different provinces and sections in the state, there is a wide swath of different habitats and conditions that the species we have in Wisconsin have to have adapted to over time and have to live with. So because of that, our species have a wide variety of very interesting adaptations to these different conditions. And so that's where I think Wisconsin's herpetofauna is particularly interesting because we have all of these, we, we don't have tons and tons of different species, but we have these species with these really interesting adaptations to dealing with uh, a wide diversity of different environmental conditions and situations. Now, among the species, even though we don't have a huge number of species in the state, we do have a variety of species that are considered in peril. So this slide shows the endangered species in the state, the species that are listed currently as endangered by the Wisconsin DNR. One of them in the upper right, the Massasauga is actually federally threatened. So um, here we have these really imperiled species in the state. And we look at this you know, slide and maybe say, well, that's not that many, they're, what is it? It's only six, right? Well, if we start adding the threatened and protected species onto the slide, we have uh, quite a few more that are considered potentially imperiled. These are species that, this isn't even all of them, but these are species that um, are in trouble and could be uh, in the future in real serious danger of going extinct if, measures aren't taken to correct those problems they face now. And so we look at this again and say, well, you know, this isn't really that many species, but proportionally, it's actually a pretty high number. So we think about the amphibians in the state that are listed as endangered or protected special concern, that is 37% of the amphibian species we have in the state. For reptiles endangered and threatened or special concern protected, that's 42% of the species in the state. So there's a large proportion of our species that are imperiled in some way. So even though it's not a high number, it is a large proportion of the species we have available here in Wisconsin. And so that's why understanding conservation initiatives and engaging in conservation initiatives like Rory will talk about to a degree, that's why that's so important in places like the Natural Resources Foundation, which are helping support conservation initiatives is so important here in Wisconsin. So we have, as I said, a relatively high proportion of species that are imperiled in some way. Uh, so why is that? What are the major threats that these organisms face? Well, there are numerous threats, unfortunately. I'm gonna show you a handful over harvesting. This can be through biological supply companies, human consumption, which isn't a huge issue for amphibians and reptiles generally, but People do eat turtles and eat frog legs, et cetera. The bait industry, human persecution. This is something that's particularly problematic with snakes, uh, such as rattlesnakes. There was a, a rattlesnake bounty until a couple of decades ago in the state. Um, there are problematic species that cause issues. These can be human subsidized predators like raccoons, which can destroy turtle nests, invasive plants, which destroy and modify habitat communities for amphibians and reptiles, pollution, Disease is a large issue. Chytrid fungus has become a real problem uh, for amphibians in particular. But there are numerous uh, potential diseases that can cause mortality in amphibians and reptiles. But despite all of these, the number one reason why globally we lose species is because of threats to habitat. Habitat loss, destruction, fragmentation, degradation, all of these things destroy habitat for amphibians and reptiles. And so conserving habitat is the number one way in which we can conserve species in general. We conserve habitat for one group, it's likely going to affect and in a positive way, conservation of other groups. And if we focus on Wisconsin specifically, I'll harken back to that pair of figures I showed you briefly at the beginning. Here is our distribution of different communities and disturbed land in the mid 1800s. And here it is now 20 years ago, almost in 2006. So there's clearly a massive expansion of working land, agricultural land, for example, a large expansion of uh, developed land. You can see clear examples in the Milwaukee area, Madison, you know, around uh, uh, the uh, Green Bay, et cetera. So lots of lost habitat for amphibians and reptiles. Now, 
we think about amphibians and reptiles from a conservation perspective. And one question I get asked frequently is, well, why should it matter? What is the value that amphibians and reptiles have? And now this is a question that clearly, you know, makes my skin crawl a little bit because trying to assign value to things is tricky, problematic, and, and we should just be able to accept organisms for what they are. But we wanted to think about the value of them ecologically. They're important predators, they're important prey. But what I often like to point to as far as the value of amphibians and reptiles in wildlife conservation is the fact that they are incredibly good at connecting people to wildlife conservation. Now, some of you might think that's crazy. People are afraid of snakes and people are think you know, frogs are slimy and gross. But the reality is I can take my wildlife students out into the field and have them hold a bull snake, have them catch frogs, have them catch turtles. I cannot have them catch and hold coyotes or bald eagles or red-tailed hawks, et cetera, et cetera. So amphibians and reptiles produce, or I'm sorry, provide this unique opportunity for us to be able to connect with wildlife and understand how exciting wildlife is, how useful it is, how important it is, and how great it is, because we can very easily physically interact with most species of amphibians and reptiles in the state. And that transcends age, it transcends social boundaries, et cetera. So if we look at these pictures, on the right are college students, and on the left are students in grade school. The students on the right are just as thrilled to be holding those reptiles as the students on the left. So it doesn't matter if they were in college, it doesn't matter if they're in grade school, amphibians and reptiles provide this incredible opportunity for us to connect with wildlife, understand their value, and connect with the importance of conservation. And so that's what I think really is important about it, amphibian and reptile conservation, is that it can provide a sort of venue or a segue for us to sort of really get into conservation as a society. So, with that, I think I'm going to turn things over to Rory so that she can start uh, talking about some more specific initiatives. And I think I have stopped sharing my screen. So Rory, hopefully you are able to go ahead. Yes, let me share here. Um, I'm going to turn my camera on just for a minute to get started. And then I will turn it off just to save some bandwidth and video. Okay, Josh or Kate, does that look good? Looks yep. good. Yep. Okay, awesome. So I am going to, thank you, Josh. That was a perfect introduction. Um, great summary of the book. Um, I was fortunate enough to be asked to work on several different chapters in the book. Um, it was a great experience to um, learn a little bit more about some of the critters really diving deeply in and just to uh, summarize everything and get the information out there for folks to, to read. Um, and Josh kind of really set the stage for um, looking at the conservation value of protecting some of these species. So I'm going to, again, very broad brush, look at a few species. So we're going to first start with the mud puppy and some work we're doing with the mud puppy in Wisconsin. Um, then we'll be talking about, I believe I have the ornate box turtle next. Um, followed by the Massasauga rattlesnake. And then finally, I'll end with a citizen science project we have, which is the Wisconsin Frog and Toad Survey. Um, and I will say I picked these projects because they're larger projects or statewide or involve a lot of partners. So while these are all, all have DNR involvement, most all of them could not, or I should say all of them could not be completed um, without the help of a lot of people, including Kate and Josh and other um, researchers and contributors that we have around the state. Okay, so the mud puppy. Um, this is a very large salamander. So the maximum size for this species is about eight to 16 inches. I feel like most of the state, most of the mud puppies I see are about eight to 12 inches, but they can get up to 16 inches. This is the largest, largest salamander we have in Wisconsin. They are fully aquatic. And this is a picture of one of the sites that we found them at, um, a good representative picture of their habitat. They really like um, those large flat rocks. They'll use rivers, streams, lakes, and occasionally they can be found in ponds as well. So one of the concerns that we have with this species is we have it listed kind of in our middle category of it's, we don't believe it's really rare in the state. We don't think it's really common. 
but because of the nature and life history of the species, we just don't know a lot about it. So we hear a lot of anecdotal reports. I'm sure a lot of you have heard reports um, or have been out fishing yourself um, and people will catch mud puppies when they're fishing. And that partly has to do with their life history. They really like to um, be in colder water. So a lot of times it's not a species that we would see, see very often. And because of that, we don't have a very good um, grasp, I guess, on the abundance and the distribution of the mud puppy within the state. But it's a species we're concerned about. Um, we've had some declines. There's been some um, die-offs of populations. So we want to get a better handle on the population and distribution of the mud puppy within Wisconsin. And so this is showing the mud puppy distribution. Um, this was taken directly from uh, Josh's book he's been, that we've been talking about. Um, so if you buy the book or happen to win one today, you'll see this map um, for the mud puppy. And so basically what we're looking at is we filled in quite a few counties here, the dark gray um, are counties where we have what we call a voucher. And those are not all museum vouchers. Um, a lot of these are, or, specimen vouchers. A lot of these are photo vouchers. That's really the trend with how we're getting vouchers is really good photos that we can document. Um, but you see the white counties here we're missing. We definitely have some gaps um, in some counties. And so our goal was to try to this winter fill in a little bit more um, of the distribution range. You know, some of these like Menominee County, you can see is very surrounded by mud puppies everywhere. So it's likely that mud puppies are there. But from a scientific and conservation perspective, we want to be able to document that. So our current project working on looking at mud puppy distribution in Wisconsin, we are conducting evening surveys for the mud puppy during the winter, which is winter surveys for amphibians and reptiles are is pretty much the opposite of what most of us would think of as a good time to do surveys for them. Um, for any kind of herp. And I should say, I'm not sure if Josh or Kate mentioned this in the beginning, I and all of us probably will use the term herp a lot. Um, and that is just kind of our shorthand for both amphibians and reptiles. Um, so generally we're not doing many herp surveys in the winter, uh, but mud puppies really like colder water. So in the middle of the summer, they're going to be in the deep holes, say in a lake. But when the winter comes, there's, um, the water is not so warm by the shore and by the surface, um, they will be more likely um, in the shoreline and some of the woody debris and they are easier for us to find um, at that time of year. So um, evening surveys, this is a nocturnal species, they feed during the, during the night. Um, so we're conducting evening surveys um, throughout the winter months. Um, we're doing most of that work this year, really have a um, concentrated effort this year. Um, and so far, we still have a few more months to go that we'll be collecting data, looking for mud puppies, but we have um, several new counties confirmed already. This is mostly thanks to um, several volunteers and contractors that we have throughout the state helping us. Um, we also have numerous counties that were reconfirmed. Um, you know, it's always good. We, some of those counties that had a, a voucher could have been 30, 40 years ago that the animals were last seen. And so it's always good from a conservation perspective to, to follow up on those um, locations and to make sure that the species is still present. So we've been doing a lot of work this, um, this winter looking at mud puppies. Um, and I do have to thank Kate and NRF um, for helping with this. Uh, there is, um, this was the funding for most of this project was provided by the first payout um, from the Wisconsin Amphibian and Reptile Conservation Fund, that, um, the endowment, endowment that Kate had mentioned. So that has been a huge, um, huge bum for mud puppies in the state. Um, I'm hopeful that we'll add a few more counties to that by the time uh, the winter is done. So the next project I wanted to talk about was our ornate box turtle. And Josh brought this up as one of the species that we have that is an endangered species in Wisconsin. So a little bit of background information on the ornate box turtle. They are small. The one that's being held here is an adult, an old adult. They reach a length of about four to five inches and they're a terrestrial species. So they're similar to what you'd think of as a tortoise. They, le they like open, semi-open habitats, dry soils, um, and they're very good at burrowing. They spend the winter in the sands, burrowed under, um, below the frost line. 
Kind of a cool thing about this species, you can see from the photo, this one has very red eyes. Um, the males have the red eyes and generally brighter coloring. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, this one had exceptionally red eyes, but they are obviously red on most of the males. So that they are pretty easy to tell apart males from females. The diet of the ornate box turtle is primarily invertebrates, uh, but they will eat a lot of other things, berries, mushrooms, vegetation. They'll feed on carrion once in a while as well. The ornate box turtle was our, on our original list of endangered and threatened species in 1972. So it's been on the state list for a long time. We have 34 records um, in the counties here highlighted that we have had records, verified records at some point in time. But because of a lot of threats, Josh mentioned a lot, um, we're down to only about 11 sites or populations of this species with, within Wisconsin, which is not a lot for one species. Um, primary threats, natural succession is a big one because the species likes open canopy habitats. We have a big issue with um, brush coming in, trees coming in, not keeping those areas, prairies open. Road mortality is an issue and collection as well. You've could tell from the, the first photo, they're tiny, they're cute little turtles, they're relatively, people think, I should say, people think they're relatively easy to keep. Um, we have had some we've kept for short periods of time and they're quite a bit of work. Um, but I think a lot of people see them, they look cute and collect them. So we definitely have a huge issue with poaching with this species. Survey methods for the ornate, we use a modified visual encounter surveys. So visual encounter surveys are just our standard surveys, basically going out, walking, looking for the animal, looking in good habitat. And the twist on this is with this species, we actually use turtle dogs. So these are Boykin Spaniels. Um, we have one researcher that sh literally spends his part of his spring and summer traveling around the eastern part of the country doing surveys for both ornate box turtles and eastern box turtles using dogs. Um, it's a pretty cool experience, but it is also very successful. The dogs are, as you could probably imagine, amazingly good at this. They can smell the turtles um, and find many more turtles than we would ever find with just human surveys. We typically conduct the surveys for ornates with the turtle dogs in early to mid-May. They kind of like temperatures similar to us, 55, 60, 80. Once it hits about 80, they're getting too warm and they're gonna go underground and cool off for the rest of the day. So this is a picture of um, John Rucker is our turtle dog researcher. Um, he has uh, normally travels with about six dogs. Sometimes he'll have all of them out, not necessarily all of them. This was a day we had all six dogs out and as you can see, um, the dogs kind of stick close together. They're very competitive. So it's pretty fun to watch them sometimes. Um, they're following him. He's kind of telling them where to look, but they really want the reward of finding a turtle. So they, you know, they know if they go to like a brush pile that that's usually a good place. They, they know where to go. They're really, um, really intent on finding those turtles and getting the reward. And their reward is just praise. They don't get, um, they don't get treats. They don't get anything else. Um, just the, the satisfaction, I guess, of pleasing everyone that they're getting the turtles. Um, this was one picture um, of three of the dogs. They were all on the same scent of a turtle. And so the dogs are smelling um, both for just the turtle itself, just the scent of the turtle, <clears throat> but the turtles also leave a scent trail as they're walking around. So we typically go out in the morning and you can see the dogs kind of wandering around and they're actually following exactly on the scent trail. So it's pretty cool to see, they kind of show us where the turtle had walked during the morning. So it's kind of interesting to see where the turtle had been, what it was checking out. So the dogs will have their nose down when they're looking, um, smelling a turtle, trying to find it. And this one on the right here is looking back up. He's looking, I think, at another dog because they're constantly looking down, looking up. They always want to be the first one to find it. So it's pretty fun to watch the dogs as well. Um, John will tell you this breed, it's not a very popular breed. Um, they're terrible watchdogs, but they're awesome bird dogs and awesome turtle dogs. And these are retrievers, so they bring the turtles back to us. There are some turtle dogs that look for the larger tortoises, especially in the western part of the country. 
and they will, they're typically pointers that are used for those. So these are retrievers. Um, most people, there's not a lot of people that do this, but most people that do this kind of work, they'll train their dogs on water balloons. And so if the dog gets a water balloon and pops it, they are not ready to go as turtle dogs yet. So for anyone that's done bird hunting, I'm sure you're well aware dogs are, these dogs are trained to be very soft, soft mouthed and the, the dogs will bring, um, bring the turtles back to us. <clears throat> but the humans do play a bit of a role in this process as well in these surveys. So we typically have um, anywhere from five to 10 researchers, students. Um, Josh has graciously loaned us some of his students from some of his classes to help out with this project. And the dogs do the main part, right, of finding the turtles and bringing them back to us. But we, so we're collecting the turtles as we're going. We typically do surveys for about two hours. And we wanna get all the turtles collected at at the same time, we don't wanna leave any of them out because the dogs will refine the same turtle. And then we bring the turtles back up to our vehicles and weigh them, measurement, measure them. I'll go through that in a little bit, but we wanna make sure we get them back to the same spot. They're turtles, right? They're not super fast moving. You know, Even though it's a two minute walk for us to the vehicle, it could take the turtles a half a day or a day to get all the way back there. So every turtle that we find, um, we give it either um, a temporary number if it isn't marked already, gets a number, we get a GPS location and then we put a flag. So here you see turtle number four gets a flag with number four. We also get a GPS location. And then after we're done with all of our work, um, we'll take the turtles back out. So we do need, um, we do need humans to, in this to some degree. I think our best site, um, which is in Rock County, our best survey day, we had, we surveyed for about an hour and a half and the turtles um, were out and about that day. The dogs found about 20 turtles, which is really good for us in an hour and a half survey. And the humans found one. So we still, I, I guess, added a little bit to that, but um, the dogs are definitely the stars of the show. So just a few photos here of processing, pretty standard um, weighing, measuring, um, getting photos so we can always ID these turtles later. They do get a mark on them so we can uniquely identify them. And, but we also get really good photos because the top and bottom of their shell, which we call the carapace and the plastron, have unique markings. And you can see it a little bit in this picture here with the calipers measuring. Um, they have those rays on their, on their shells and those are unique to each turtle. So it's similar to a fingerprint for a human, um, we can identify the turtles based on um, their pattern as well. So after they're done with their um, checkups for the year, um, we take them out and put them back right next to where their flag was, collect the flag and leave them on their way and then um, come back and hopefully recapture them the next year. And um, this study has really helped us get estimates on population size. It's showed us um, different habitats that the species is using, and then just showed us generally um, population trends and which sites have, um, have the most abundance of turtles. Um, so we've done about 10 years of surveys so far. We've surveyed over 25 sites of our historic sites with the turtle dogs. And we've confirmed 11 sites in Wisconsin. And one of these was actually reported by a citizen scientist. I won't go into this project a lot, but we do have a uh, turtle road crossing citizen science project where you can go online and report any turtle crossings that you see on roads. And the purpose of this is to try to get a better idea for us throughout the state where our high mortality areas or even high crossing areas are, and then to work with um, the DOT uh, to ideally put underpasses in in a lot of those locations. So one of these came in, one of these new, newer sites with the old historic record um, was confirmed this year um, by us or last year by a citizen scientist. Uh, we're doing the mark recapture at three different sites to get a better idea of the population, sorry, to get a better idea of the population size and then, then at the other properties um, we're just trying to get an idea of habitat use more so um, and where management maybe is most effective. So very broad brush of the ornate, um, moving on to the Eastern Massasauga rattlesnake. 
So this is a small rattlesnake that we have in Wisconsin. It never, maybe we've one record in the country ever of this species getting to three feet. So it's generally about two feet long. It is one of two rattlesnakes native to Wisconsin and has the nickname of swamp rattler because unlike most rattlesnakes, this species actually likes to use wetland habitats. Similar to a lot of the other amphibians and reptiles we've been talking about, primary threats are human persecution and habitat alteration. This species in general, because of the wetland component, it also is fairly impacted by hydrologic changes, especially if there's changes done during the winter when the species is overwintering. The brown here in the map is the historic range of the Massasauga, and we do think they were fairly numerous throughout that range. Within the green counties now, we have um, only eight extant or currently occupied sites. So only eight sites left, unfortunately, for the species in Wisconsin. As Josh mentioned earlier, there was a bounty on both of our rattlesnake species, the Massasauga and the timber rattlesnake. That was removed in 1975. This species has been state endangered since 1975. It was listed as a candidate federal species in 1998 and was listed as federally threatened in 2016. So I'm gonna go through just briefly some of our survey methods for monitoring this species. So just in terms of monitoring, um, we're following US Fish and Wildlife Survey protocols. We have two primary sites, our two most populated populous sites. And these are visual encounter surveys. Again, we're doing mark recapture, so we're marking the animals. Um, and then when we recapture them, it can help us get a population estimate. And these are surveys that are conducted during spring. So this is a typical survey day. We have 10 or so researchers out just looking uh, for the snake. We're just trying to find as many snakes as we can to get information on them and to get a population estimate. As you can tell here from the reed canary grass, um, it is literally kind of like looking for a needle in a haystack trying to find these snakes. Um, we're stopped here because one of the researchers found a snake and it is in the photo. So it's fairly visible if any of you can see it. So it is actually right here. And that is that guy. So I don't know how this guy, how this researcher found this. He was very difficult to see, but um, they like to stay hidden and they can be pretty difficult to find. So we need to have, um, we need to do repeated surveys at these sites because we know we're going to be missing animals undercover. So the Massasagas, we're always handling these very carefully, of course. These are venomous, um, drop per drop. They are a very venomous species. Um, but they are a smaller snake. So we're using, these are special snake tongs called gentle giant tongs that don't allow us to um, grasp the snake too tightly. And similar to the ornate box turtle, once we get a snake, we go through just standard measurements. Here we're weighing the snake. Um, we do get the snakes in tubes, um, snake tubes, which a lot of veterinary clinics and zoos use as well to safely handle, measure, examine the animals. So here we're measuring the snake and then also looking um, for any signs of disease that the snake may have. And then we are doing these surveys for one week um, straight, five straight days. We re repeatedly survey the same site. So we do get information on the individual, but we also want to mark the snake. So if we see it the next day, we don't have to pick it up and bother it again. Um, so we paint a temp put a temp temporary paint on the tail of the snake. Um, they get a little green painted tail, and this just helps us um, if we see it at a distance, you know, if we find a snake, see it from five feet away the next day and see it as a green tail, we just leave it and go on. So we know we've already captured that snake during that survey effort. And when we're done with the surveys, same as the Ornay box turtles, they go back um, within a foot of where we found them um, with the addition of their little green tail that will wash off fairly quickly. And just a little bit of results in 2021, we had 28 snakes that we observed, um, a mix of neonates, juveniles, and adults. And neonates we define as snakes that um, have been hatched or born in the last year. These, are, these snakes are considered live bearers. So they don't lay eggs. They actually have an egg sac inside the female. And so the, the young actually hatch 
inside the female and it appears that they're giving birth, although it's not the same birth process as a mammal would have. Um, but this arrow here is showing how we identify neonates. They have this little um, egg sac scar or little belly button that'll be fresh in the snakes that are um, just a few weeks old or a couple days old. And then their rattle will just have their original little rounded button rattle segment, just the one segment at the end. And then in 2022, um, we observed 52 individual snakes. And you'll see from both of these surveys, we have a really good mix of um, uh, different age classes, young snakes, juvenile snakes, and adult snakes. And we also have a really good ratio of male versus female in these populations. And then lastly, I wanted to touch um, just a little bit on the Wisconsin Frog and Toad Survey. This is a citizen monitoring survey with the goal of collecting data on abundance, distribution, and population trends of Wisconsin frogs. This was started in the early 80s, and we believe it is one of the longest running amphibian monitoring projects in North America. And this is a type of citizen project that anyone can get involved in. We have several different types of surveys. We have our standard surveys, which I'll talk about a little bit. We also have phenology surveys where you can monitor one pond and just get information on the starting and ending periods for different species calling. And then for those folks that live in the northern part of Wisconsin, there are mink frog surveys as well. That's a species that's more in boreal habitats um, and is fairly rare in Wisconsin. So we're trying to get more information on species. The survey protocols for our standard surveys, the surveys are conducted at night. They're breeding call surveys. Um, warm, cloudy evenings are usually best. And the surveyor will listen for five minutes at each site. And they have a total of 10 sites that they will survey and they'll do that three different times a year. So it'll be a three night commitment and usually takes about two to three hours with driving time in between sites. And this is kind of a good reference showing the different species we have in Wisconsin. They're similar to birds. They all have a unique call so we can identify the frogs by their calling. It's a really effective way to monitor frog populations. And each of the species has a little bit different calling period. So um, you'll see that displayed here, the green, the frogs in green are definitely picked up during our first calling period. The blue are picked up during the second, and then the last four are picked up during our summer calling period. There's a lot more information online about this. Um, just wanted to give everyone a really broad brush again. Um, survey results, uh, we have about 187 survey results statewide. Um, over the course of the entire project, we have surveyed have um, surveyed on 8,300 survey nights, and we have almost 83,000 individual site visits. There is a 15-year assessment that's been written up, and we are working on a 40-year assessment. And I can just leave this up. Um, this is these are some resources: the Frog and Toad Survey website, as well as a frog quiz to quiz yourself. And then the Madison Audubon Society has uh, calling CDs and then MP3 downloads as well. And that is it. Awesome. Thanks so much, Rory and Josh. And I will, uh, and we're going to have a re the recording available on our, on our website um, as well. So folks can reference these resources. And um, I did want to pull up, I do have one more slide actually. Yep. Right. I can <laughs> stop sharing. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to pull up something, but then we'll move to Q&A. So if folks want to um, ask questions, you're welcome to put those in the using the Q&A feature in the chat. Um, and I just, you know, I think we wanted to end here with some ways that you all can help Wisconsin's amphibians and reptiles. So we came up with a nice, tidy list of five things that you can do. So as you heard, nearly half of Wisconsin's uh, species of amphibians and reptiles are endangered or at risk. And some of the ways, as Rory just shared, um, you can participate in a citizen-based monitoring project, so the Frog and Toad Survey, uh, or the Wisconsin Turtle Conservation Program, uh, which she mentioned earlier. So you can report turtle crossings, for example. You can create wildlife-friendly habitat, which of course benefits not just 
uh, herptiles, but many, many other species, pollinators, birds, for example. So leaving down logs or leaf litter or adding rock and wood features can help create, create habitat, um, leaving, if not the whole thing, unmowed, uh, at least certain sections unmowed, uh, planting native wildflowers and grasses, avoiding pesticides, and then keeping cats indoors is a big one, of course. Uh, do your research and, you know, Rory and Josh, feel free to jump in here too if you want to elaborate on any of these. Uh, but do your research if you're going to have an amphibian or reptile pet. So native Wisconsin species should never be sold in pet stores uh, and make sure you never release pets into the wild. I'm sure, Rory, that's something you have to deal with on occasion with your work at the department. Yes, definitely. Uh, <laughs> Uh, here's a big one. Be care really careful about revealing specific locations of species. So with the illegal pet trade, um, people, I think, are looking for these sites. So making sure to keep it, you know, like we try to keep uh, any photographs or when we talk about these critters at the county level. And Marie, I don't know if you'd like to elaborate on that at all. Yeah, that's a good rule of thumb. We have some species will provide information on township, but yeah, generally county level, Massasauga, um, like my map had only counties. So yeah, we're always, it, unfortunately, it's probably, you know, less than 1% of the people out there that would do anything malicious with the information. But unfortunately, we have to take that into account when we're doing things. Mm -hmm. And last one, again, just a plug, if you uh, care about Wisconsin's amphibians and reptiles, here's that link to the fund, uh, wisconservation.org slash W-A-R-C-F. And with that, we'll move to a Q&A that I'll facilitate here. Uh, let's see here. Here's a question about development housing projects, um, checking out the area to make sure animals are not harmed when digging up the land. Can you stop development if there are incidental takes of frogs or turtles in certain areas? Rory, that might be one for you. Yeah, so we do look at that. So um, projects that are going forward, if they're having, if there's another DNR permit involved or not, we have a rare species database called a natural heritage inventory database. Um, and that we have about 20, 25,000 records for the state of Wisconsin on our rare species. And we do check that anytime we're permitting a project to look at that. So, um, you know, unfortunately, there's not the same regulations for common species from a conservation perspective. Um, but we are looking very closely for the rare species when there's development projects coming up. Here's an interesting one. Uh, are there, I'm sorry, they're all interesting. <laughs> Here's one that caught my eye though. Uh, are there any known hotspots for imperiled herb species that are currently unprotected and might be good candidates for the Knowles Nelson Stewardship Fund? I'm not familiar with the Knowles Nelson Stewardship Fund. I'm embarrassed to say, Rory, do you know that one? <laughs> yes, there's always more properties that we could have protected. Um, you know, we're fortunate that a lot of our good sites for Massasaugas in particular are on public land. Um, but yes, there's always, there are always more, more properties that could be protected for herps in Wisconsin and protect them into the future. Can you speak to the effect of prescribed fire on reptiles and amphibians? This is important to maintain habitat, but these species are not easily able to escape fire. So I'm wondering what the best practices are for burning areas while protecting these species. So there's a, Rory, I don't mean to jump on you here, but I'll- No, nope, go ahead. I was going to tell you to go. <laughs> yeah, um, there's actually, we, we cover a lot of information about prescribed fire in the book um, because there, there are so many different avenues to consider. You have to consider, first of all, um, the species involved. Some species are better at avoiding fire than others. Um, you have to consider the timing. So you have to consider the act, uh, when that species might be active. Um, and usually that would be when you'd work with the DNR about, you know, when is the best time to, per, to conduct that prescribed burn to make sure that you're avoiding any uh, active uh, species that might be out and about. Um, and so the, the, there, there are, there's been actually limited hard research conducted on the effect of fire on herbs. There, there's been a number of studies, but compared to a lot of other potential threats, that amphibians and reptiles face, the idea of studying the actual benefits or impacts of prescribed fire to amphibians and reptiles is um, sort of a new area of, of research compared to some of these other threats. So, or relatively speaking, newer area. 
Um, but yeah, there is information available. Um, it's very context driven and species specific. Roy, do you have anything to add for that one? No, I think you covered it well. All right. Who decides if a herp is threatened or endangered? Why aren't some rare snakes like the worm snake or lined snake on the list? Yes, I saw that one. I was just scrolling through. Um, so the Department of Natural Resources is ultimately responsible for creating and maintaining the list of endangered and threatened species in Wisconsin. And we actually have just started a process to revise the list again. Um, we do coordinate with a lot of externals to get um, external expertise on changes to the list as well. Um, the worm snake and the lion snake are very good questions. Um, the lion snake um, person that asked about this probably knows they were fairly recently discovered in Wisconsin. We have one or two sites for that species, the worm snake three. Um, and part of that is a timing issue with when those animals were species were found. So I think both of those are going to be um, at the top of our list, I would say, for discussion, for, for, be, for moving on to the list. I you know, don't, can't say for sure, of course, what's going to happen, but I think there'll be a lot of discussion around those two and possibly moving those on. You have time for a couple more, Rory and Josh? Yep, I'm good till whenever. Okay. <laughs> uh, can citizen scientists help with mud puppy surveys or salamander counts? Yes, this is a good question. Um, we actually are in the process of, um, one of my coworkers, Rich Stathan, um, is in the process of, we're starting a salamander citizen monitoring project. So we're gonna be um, kind of starting to finalize some methods this year and probably piloting it next year um, in 2024. But yes, the plan with that is it would be an ephemeral pond salamander project that we want to get citizens involved with. Um, and then mud puppy surveys, um, we don't have anything as formal, but we are happy to take any reports and photos of mud puppies that folks find. And you're asking uh, ice fisher folks to report, right? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, my gosh, so many good questions here. Well, I, I wanna be respectful of everyone's time. So I think we're gonna go ahead and wrap up. Um, but I just wanted to say a big thank you to Josh and Rory for your, your time today, sharing all this knowledge and for everyone here for, for participating and for your interest in Wisconsin's amphibians and reptiles. Hope to see you in the field sometime. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thanks Kate. <laughs>